This is one of the 2020 horror movies I was most excited to watch. It has a creepy trailer that sets itself up as a haunted house style movie in the same vein as the original Poltergeist. A little girl gets captured by the house and it's up to the parents and some kind of oracle to save the day. But what's being produced is a mess. A blend of horror elements for the fans and cheap scares for the casuals. Hi, I'm the Artie Dance from Asian Film Fans and welcome to this review of the Korean horror film, The Closet. And as usual with my Korean reviews, I apologize for the poor pronunciation. So I'm going to try and add some captions with the names. There will also be spoiler talk as I discuss why this movie doesn't work. So look out for the watermark and enjoy. The story here is quite solid, at least initially. If you're familiar with classic horror movies, this movie mixes the aforementioned poltergeist with the exorcist, throwing in some light possession into the haunted house element. A single father, Sang Won, and his 11-year-old daughter Inna move into a large house in the countryside as a form of therapy. He suffers from panic attacks after the death of his wife in a car accident, and Inna is reserved and cold. She misses her mother and resents her father, who seems to be desperate to get other people to look after her. While in their new house, Inna's behaviour towards her father changes. First, she becomes open and affectionate, but then that quickly turns distant and cold when she realises her father is going to leave her alone in the house with a nanny. All this occurs after an incident with the closet. After finding a nanny to watch over his daughter, Sungwon is shocked by a call. The nanny has quit and his daughter is missing. He desperately searches for his daughter, only to stumble across Kyung Hoon, an exorcist who is an expert in missing children cases and suspects that Inna is trapped in another dimension with a vengeful spirit. On the surface, that sounds pretty good. It's the execution of the story where it fails. If you're a lover of horror films and have been disappointed recently with all the Western output of the PG-13 type films, then this will really disappoint you as well. It does have some gore, but that's not the only reason to watch a horror film. You watch it for the unknown, the feeling of fear you can get. The sound, the music, the visuals, they're all supposed to come together. And by the books, they do here. If there was a horror movie checklist, this one ticks all the right boxes. But then they had to go and stuff it all up with the exorcist character. This stumbling, idiotic buffoon ruins the tension in the movie the second he arrives on screen pretending to be an internet technician. It gets worse as he is used as the movie's light comedy element. This is an annoying filmmaker trick to make the movie appeal to a wider audience. They were obviously too scared, pun intended, to make a pure horror movie for the hardcore and thus added this light element to appeal to casual cinema goers that destroys the second half of the film. And that's a real shame. But then to top it off, the story also takes a major, almost cruel turn which I'll discuss in the not so hot segment as it's a spoiler. The creepy little girl makeup is fantastic. It sets the new benchmark in Asian cinema that's been the trend since Juon, and it works really well. Top marks to the makeup and visual effects department for their sinister and evil little creation. Other standouts in the horror sections include the Netherworld sequence where San Juan enters the closet to save Inna at the end. This is yet another creative set designed by the crew that highlights a nightmarish children's playroom, coupled with the excellent use of lighting, both blue and red tones. This looks terrific, as does the scene that immediately precedes it in the hallway of the house, giving off a very strong Silent Hill vibe. There's also another very emotional and very memorable scene at around the 10 minute mark where Inna is watching a video of her mother singing Happy Birthday. While it might be a typical trope to establish the character's connection to a departed loved one, it's sold to the audience exceptionally well by the young actress Yu Hyo in what seems to be her first movie performance. Her performance is the standout of the film, and she holds up the movie on her young shoulders in the first half. 
It's a shame there is a huge stretch of the movie that doesn't feature her, because that's when the terrible exorcist character enters and ruins the day. Before we head into spoiler territory where I will totally destroy the movie for you, so sorry about that in advance, there is one very annoying sequence that occurs at the beginning of the film I want to talk about. This shaky home video camera sequence. Now it's not the content of what's being filmed here that's the problem, it's the way it's presented to the audience. Who, in the late 90s, takes what seems to be three or four video cameras to an exorcism and then edits the footage together. Every few seconds there is a camera angle cut and there doesn't seem to be anyone else filming this event. It's a small and stupid thing to be annoyed at, but if I was CinemaSins, then this would be the first thing I would pick out. Also, it goes without saying, the Exorcist character is a terrible element. If the scene of him slurping noodles doesn't want to make you punch him, then it's the stupid behaviour during the exorcism at the end that will make you cheer on his death, which unfortunately doesn't happen. Now onto the story. Watch out for the spoiler watermark and skip to the time frame listed to avoid this section if you haven't seen the movie and don't want to be spoiled. The story makes no sense and it's very badly explained to the audience. Essentially, it's the vengeful spirit of a little girl who's trapped inside a closet by her father who then died in a house fire. Her father was in debt and didn't want to keep living, so he kills his wife and daughter who we see begging him to let her live. At no time do we get the impression, other than this event, that he is a bad father. Yet this little girl's spirit is reborn to help avenge the lives of children who are abused by their parents. It would make sense if we could see that she was abused more than just this one event. She is the entity responsible for the kidnapping of 19 other children, including Inna, via their closets as the gateway to her netherworld. Then we get the stupid rules, like the 49 days. Where did that come from and what is the significance of it? And who decides how the spirit can be rescued and what needs to be done for that to happen? If there was an explanation about how the vengeful girl was the reincarnation of a mythical spirit who already had a set of rules in their law about how they could be defeated, that would make sense. But that's not what this movie does. And then finally, in a scene that made me almost destroy my television in anger, is the scene where the vengeful spirit is reunited with her mother. She turns from evil back to just a little girl, crying and so ecstatic to see her mother again. This is what defeats her, and it would be fine, but all of a sudden, as she goes to hug her mother, she disappears. This is horrible. The spirit misses her mother of all things, and when you give her what she wants and then take it away from her again, we are expected to believe as the audience that she would be okay with this. Then to top it off, we see Inna in the netherworld, surrounded by other children who are clearly her friends. This was a girl who in the real world was sad because she was lonely, because she had no one. In the netherworld, it's full of both friends and protectors, and then her father, who we've seen doesn't really care about her beyond buying her some dolls, comes to save her. As the audience, we're supposed to believe that she will have a better life with her miserable father than all her new friends? Just a stupid, stupid ending written with very little thought. Then of course, they had to end it with a setup for a sequel, which I hope never gets made. The worst part about this film isn't just the story, or the terrible exorcist character, or the lack of logic in explaining the ending. It's the fact that most casual film goers will watch this film and think it's an awesome horror film, which then means Hollywood will remake it. Back to the drawing board with this one, please. Rewrite it as a proper horror movie that truly is an homage to Poltergeist and The Exorcist, and not something that feels like a spin-off of the Tide Annabelle series. If you've seen it, what did you think? Thank you for watching this review. Please don't forget to press the like button and consider subscribing to support our channel.